Hello, and a very warm welcome to this webinar brought to you by Drake Star Partners and Delta EE. The electric vehicle market is booming. There are 2 million electric vehicles on European roads today, rising to around 40 million by 2030. Governments are continuing to announce new policies and subsidies to support the uptake of EVs and reboot the economies on the back of COVID-19. And we are seeing ever more in the way of investments, mergers and acquisitions, and companies jostling for position to secure their stake in the EV charging value chain. During the next 45 minutes or so, we will be discussing some of the trends that have shaped the EV charging landscape over the next 10 years, and looking forward to seeing what the future holds. But first, let me introduce you to my colleagues who are joining me on the webinar today. We are delighted to have colleagues from Drakestar with us, from their mobility, mobility team, who are specializing in EV charging M&A transactions. So hello to all of you. On the call, we have Frank Verbeek, Dominic Hood, and Sharif Rahim. Frank, would you like to start by saying a few words by way of background? Yeah, uh, thank you, John and uh, Team Delta AE. Good afternoon to all. Um, I think it's a great privilege and an honor to have you all on this webinar. Um, I only have 30 seconds to introduce ourselves, so I think uh, we should not waste time, and here we go. Um, as I said, my name is Frank Furbeck. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Drexar Amsterdam. Uh, for the world, for who um, doesn't know Drakestar, uh, Drakestar Partners is an investment bank, um, global coverage, um, and around 95 deal makers. Um, we closed all together, I think, 11 deals in the past 12 weeks only, uh, meaning that we are still doing deals even during COVID. Um, and Drakestar is really about uh, deals in the technology space um, uh, around M&A and growth financing. Uh, and as you can uh, read on the slide, um, we are true believers in um, the innovation. Um, the innovation is also uh, in a way organized that we are managing uh, well-selected verticals. Uh, the team in Drexar Amsterdam consists of 18 people and we are globally responsible for the vertical mobility, energy transition and smart city. And as you can see from the tombstones, uh, we are trying to at least uh, do quite some landmark deals, not only in EV charging, but also in the mobility space. Uh, this year only, we closed already four deals. Um, and my colleagues, uh, Sharif Rahim, uh, principal, and Dominique Hood, partner, uh, are having this uh, vertical out of Amsterdam. Uh, so we are extremely eager to uh, exchange info and, uh, of course, uh, share all the insights. So let's start the webinar, and uh, we consider this as a start of an ongoing dialogue. So you are invited to contact all of us, um, as I truly believe that we are all really uh, very eager to make the innovation happen and change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Frank. And we're really pleased to have this collaboration between Drakestar and Delta EE. Um, uh, so yeah, we're looking forward to a really fantastic discussion. Um, I should also introduce before we get any further, uh, Delta EE. So my name is John Murray, Head of EVs here at Delta, um, but I'm also joined by my colleague, uh, Alex Lewis-Jones, who is the manager of our EVs and electricity research service. Hi, John, and hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, um, thanks for joining, and we can hear you loud and clear, Alex. So, Okay, um, and this webinar is giving us the opportunity, of course, to bring together uh, the two communities from Drakestar and Delta EE. Um, so for those of you that are not so familiar with Delta, I'll just say a few words and try and do the 30-second elevator pitch for us. So we are a, a research and consulting company that is laser focused on the energy transition. And so we help our clients to understand uh, the best strategies, business models and propositions to help them succeed um, in this space. We cover a lot of different knowledge areas. Of course, our focus for Alex and myself and the rest of our EV team is around EVs and electricity. We provide support to clients in one of two ways. We have ongoing subscription-based research services, uh, like the EVs and electricity research service that Alex uh, manages. And we also do bespoke consultancy, such as commercial due diligence for M&A transactions, that sort of thing. And this slide here, where you can just see at the end some examples of the clients that we have worked with in the past and that we continue to work with um, to, to, to this day. Um, before we get into the content of the webinar, some brief housekeeping. 
our intention is to present our content for around 35 to 40 minutes and then have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Throughout the webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. So please write down your questions and submit them in that box, hopefully on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we will come to those at the end. We may try and capture one or two of those as we go along as well. Um, the webinar is being recorded, um, so the recording will be available to watch back at your leisure um, from tomorrow morning. And the slides will be available as well um, and will be emailed to you after, after the webinar. So no need to take screenshots as we go through. Um, this is the agenda. So first of all, we'll, we'll be setting the scene and saying that EVs have arrived. We'll be talking about the complex e-mobility ecosystem looking at some of the M&A transactions which have shaped the sector and looking at sort of how the EV charging market has evolved over the last years and then finally looking ahead to some of the trends that we expect to see in the future. So let's get started. First things first, the EV market is here. It's already here and it's coming at us very very quickly. EVs are already disrupting the car industry and throughout this decade we expect to see huge growth in numbers of EVs on the road. Over the last uh, four to five years, we've seen a five-fold increase in the number of EVs on the road. And even in the first five months of 2020, we have seen some huge increases in terms of uh, e you know, new registrations of EVs. So in, in the UK, there's been a 64% increase of new EVs on the road in these first five months, 76% uh, increase in France, a 92% increase year on year in Germany. And this is despite the fact that the car industry has really been decimated over this, this period due to COVID-19. So really marked increase in terms of EVs. In Norway, okay, year on year, the number of registrations for electric vehicles has fallen by 4%, but EVs represent pretty much a 70% market share in terms of new cars coming onto the road. So I think we can let them off. Looking forward, we've done some, uh, you know, we, we developed a model which is forecasting the uptake of EVs in Europe. And by 2030, we expect to see around 40 million EVs on the road. Um, so that's you know, from 2 million to 40 million over the next 10 years. And if we needed any more evidence that the EV market is here, Tesla has recently become, as I'm sure most of you will know, the most valuable car manufacturer in the world. So it's not the fact that EVs are coming, I think EVs are here and are going to really disrupt the market um, in the next years as well. So next we want to, I'm going to hand over to Alex, which is going to talk a little bit about the different types of charging that we're seeing. So over to you, Alex. Thanks, John. So to enable that growth of the EV market, we need to have quasi infrastructure and that needs to be convenient and fit with the lifestyle of EV customers. The thing here is that lifestyles are quite varied and I'll use this graphic to demonstrate what that means for charging infrastructure. So if you look at the left hand side of this graphic you can see various locations of places that we might typically park. The orange bar to the right of that is an indicator of how long you spend uh, parked at that location or the dwell time of that location. And then the grid to the side of that is our attempt to explain what the likely types of charging technologies are for each of those different use cases. So at the top you can see different power ratings for different types of charge point. Uh, from the really uh, slow 3.4 kilowatts up to the 350 kilowatt HPC solutions that are commonly talked about today. The percentages below are questions around how much would my battery get recharged if I was using that charge point at that uh, location for this amount of time. And the key takeaway here is that really there's a sweet spot for different charging technologies at different locations. And in order to enable those to work, we need a lot of different business models. Um, so if you click on the next um, point, John, you can just see that dark shaded blue area there is, is, is likely where we see different, um, different charging technologies being applied in different uh, models. So 
on to the next slide to enable this quite varied different uh, charging market we have quite a complex ecosystem of roles we've simplified this down into four parts of the value chain um, so we have the supply side so this is uh, looking at building up the solutions deployment focuses on retail and installation operation is actually the charging sessions themselves and finally energy services which is an emerging space um, where utilities and grid uh, integrators are getting involved just to focus on two parts of this value chain then i'd like to explore a bit more of particular roles so in supply that can be hardware so the charge point manufacturers or EVSE is a common uh, acronym used across Europe and then there's the uh, the software side so back office or back-end providers building up the software that uh, allows for interoperability between charge points and vehicles and uh, and customer apps from the operation side there's two more roles that you need to be aware of and that is uh, when it comes up uh, the the cpo uh, so that's the charge point operator that is the party that's responsible for getting the electricity from the grid and into your car now that could be an asset heavy cpo where they own and operate all the uh, charge points themselves or it could be asset light where they do more of a service based business model and the second acronym there is the EMSP, the e-mobility service provider, and that party is responsible for holding the customer relationship, so helping you locate, access, and pay for charging services. Now, the way I've cut it there looks like it's quite well defined and quite clear cut, but the reality can be quite different, and different players might do multiple of those roles and their strategies might evolve over time and a great way to see how that evolves is by looking at the transactions that have happened in this m a uh, space so on that note i think i'll finish there john and um, pass on to yourself and um our, our colleagues at drake start to talk us through um m a yeah sure so thank you for that handover and um uh, we truly believe that uh, that the way you describe the value chain and the developments in the sector, those are uh, a number of key drivers behind M&A uh, and fundraising activity in the sector. So maybe to, to start, I'm quite sure that uh, most of the people in the webinar have seen a number of the headlines of a large corporates uh, making strategic acquisitions uh, into EV charging companies. Um, and also a number of uh, multi-billion infrastructure funds uh, recently becoming active by acquiring um, EV charging companies or uh, part of an EV charging company, like for instance, a majority uh, acquisition of infra capital uh, of the, 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 the asset heavy CPO part of Fortu. Um, so yeah, we've been involved in a number of those transactions and we uh, have put in the effort to build the first real complete database of companies uh, that have been involved in M&A and uh, investment activities. Um, and we've actually plotted them against uh, the value chain that you've just, just described and looked at uh, what are uh, the, the, the size of the transactions, the type of transactions, and did some further analysis on what were actually the rationales behind of the, uh, the investors and the acquirers coming into play into the sector. And what is quite interesting is that's an, an interesting sector with a whole range of different type of uh, investors and buyers. And you see from the automotive space, car OEMs, but also a select number of tier one suppliers um, uh, that are active. And on the energy side, uh, oil and gas companies um, are becoming more and more energy companies as well. Uh, and utilities uh, for, for, for who is a more um, logical extension of their business uh, coming into play. Um, so those are, I think, the key trends and the key activities that we've seen. And one interesting uh, highlight is uh, in, in 2020, the first half of the year, was actually one of the most active uh, M&A um, uh, first six months, um, even despite COVID-19. So um, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, with also the announced government incentives, 
and so on. We, we'd expect this continuous uh, trend and for the upcoming years to even uh, see an acceleration of M&A and uh, fundraising activity. So there's some aggregated over of uh, numbers here. So there was about two and a half billion invested into the sector since 2016, over 100 transactions. Um, and we've seen broadly seven um, uh, investor or buyer categories uh, of, um, of companies uh, becoming active in the space. Um, based on the database, we've we've looked at a couple of um, um, uh, of metrics, and that's most, mostly related to the transaction structures, um, and where we highlighted that utilities and oil and gas majors have been mostly active in uh, making platform acquisitions, which are quite sizable, and uh, from those doing some bolt-ons for technology or geographical expansion. And we'll give some examples of that um, later in the presentation as well. In terms of uh, valuations of companies in the space, um, what is interesting is that uh, quite a lot of, well, actually most companies uh, in EV charging uh, are not profitable yet. Um, what is um, interesting in the space that the, the companies that are not profitable but are showing high growth um, um, revenues, those are actually the most valuable companies that we've seen in the space uh, so far. But it also has some implication on the on the valuation methodology. So it's quite difficult to uh, do a um, quite a standard valuation methodology of the discounted cash flows, you would call it, uh, where you would look at the future cash flows that would come from uh, that would be generated by a company, uh, or EBDA multiples, uh, as most companies are still uh, loss making, are also quite challenging. So. We compared uh, revenue multiples across the value chain for the different type of companies, and we've uh, plotted as well uh, certain characteristics of companies uh, that show higher valuations versus others that are at the low end of the spectrum. And we'll go in, uh, into that at the end of the presentation as well. One interesting um, point is that the deal sizes are increasing uh, quite steep. So uh, companies with a 50 million plus valuation um, that are involved in transactions, um, it's almost more than half of all transactions are at that level. Although it's still relatively small, 50 million, uh, if you look at the, into other industries, but also looking into where the industry is now, so quite at an early stage in terms of EV adoption, um, we're yeah, actually very enthusiastic uh, to see where the valuations are going, and we see this steadily increasing as well. Um, well one company in the US, uh, ChargePoint, uh, they're definitely leading the pack with a one billion uh, valuation in the latest fundraising, um, and we definitely expect a number of European uh, companies moving towards uh, that that region as well. Um, so that was was one of the trends that we've uh, we've identified, um, and we we will continue to to track the EV charging sector because we think it's important to make it uh, transparent and also to see what is happening in in the space as well. So, so one of the key takeaways from from that, Sharif, is that you know e even though that in the, in the the EV charging space in most parts of the value chain, frankly, it is still difficult at these volumes to turn a profit. We've already seen evidence that the the market valuations for these transactions is increasing quite significantly, even over the last couple of years, um, and probably expecting that trend trend to continue even more so as the number of companies that are uh, or the number of advanced companies you know are quickly getting bought up by some of the leading players in this space. And uh, Dominic, you were going to say a few words, I think, in terms of um, the, the, the five key stages um, that we've seen in terms of this evolving EV charging sector. Yes, indeed. And uh, I think what is really, really interesting here is that while we have, you know, over these uh, four to five years, seemingly a large number of transactions, uh, of a lot of different companies, we had a really differing type of rationals and risk profile as well over that period. And then that really took place in different phases. So I think we can go through here so some of the phases. I think the first one really was the pioneering phase. The first companies appeared, uh, were invested. I think we had here this initial wave of investment really characterized by the participation of uh, venture capital firms and OEMs. Uh, I think the venture capitals liked the financial returns. They could handle the risk at this early stage where even they was not sure whether there would be a market or not, or it would be durable. And, and from the automotive OEM standpoint, then we had 
a, uh, that was important for technological monitoring standpoint, so they could really stay close to the technologies which were emerging at the time. Uh, and, um, and this is really what we saw initially in this market. As you can imagine, the valuations were characterized by a, a fairly high discount rate at the time. Um, and that was the first, the, 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 the first phase. So in the second phase, something really interesting happened. In the meantime, there's been a realization largely by energy company that we had uh, a proximity of the core business with EV charging, respectively from utilities and oil and gas majors. I think from the utility standpoint, it was a view that there the, the could be some interesting value chain extension by selling electricity to those networks. And oil and gas company, it was more substitution element uh, but what you have seen as the rig profile of the sector was becoming more and more acceptable as well, or, 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 or rather a bit more secure, you have seen large investment, both from a, a, a stake point of view or m and point of view, full m and point of view of those type of companies uh, into the sector, uh, which really took place between 2016 and 2018. Um, and, and this has been leading as the market has continued to grow significantly by something quite telling leading to the third phase, uh, which where we had a significant amount, a lot more registrations of vehicles, a lot more charging sessions as well, a lot more established patterns of you know where those charging sessions would take place. Uh, and let's not forget as well, a much more complete offering of charging. We sometimes talk about that cars, you need to be able to satisfy a lot of different customers. The same applies for charging. The format and speed of charging is important uh, or the variety of it to be able to, to meet most of the convenience factors. Uh, so what we have seen with the scale coming in and, and really a, a more accepted use of electric cars and the charging, we have seen the overall risk profile diminishing, people able to take a longer view, and then we saw the entry of the institutional investors uh, that has been characterized by certain transactions, the one mentioned recently by Sharif, um, by the uh, infracapital transaction, uh, buying the majority in the photo network, uh, and also a lot by, institution, by uh, infra infrastructure funds. Uh, so this is where we have seen here, and again, the, the returns that are now that are now um, uh, determined by long-term values up to 10 years uh, are now lower than what you saw early on in the first phases. So I think that characterizes really different type of companies, different type of risk profiles, which we have seen over the last five years for all these transactions. But thanks, thanks very much for that, Dominic. And I think that um, illustrates quite clearly sort of how the EV charging sector has evolved over the last years up until the present time so th thank you for doing that and, and we've seen those different stages and sort of how that kind of plays out in terms of that risk and return profile and the different types of companies that are that are getting involved before we turn our attention to looking forward what we'd like to do now is introduce our poll um, so what we'd like to do is ask all of the attendees who are on the line this question which players are going to lead M&A investment activity in the EV charging sector over the next five years? And there's five options to choose from, the vehicle manufacturers, the oil companies, uh, sorry, the energy companies, the oil and gas majors, the infrastructure funds or others, which might include, for example, the, the, the tech giants and companies such as those. So, let me launch the poll. So hopefully from now, you will be able to see the answers, uh, the possible options on your screen. So please do select which ones you think are going to be most active in the sector. We can see the answers are coming in already. So thank you very much for that. We will just give you maybe another 15 seconds to choose. I think 70% of people on the line have already selected an answer. So thank you for that. We'll just give you five more seconds. So if you're still choosing, make sure to select an answer any second now before we close. Okay, so thank you very much. We're gonna close the poll now and quickly share the results. So hopefully now you can see those on your screen. Okay, so what have we got? 37%, so about a third of people, just over a third saying energy companies, followed by 23% the oil and gas majors, 22% the infrastructure funds, 11% the car manufacturers, then 7% other. So quite a broad spread actually, no one really with more than a third market share, so quite even across the different types. 
Anyone uh, got any sort of initial reaction to that? I mean, I think it's interesting that, and you know, it's quite evident perhaps that there's maybe not necessarily going to be one one group that's going to be leading the charge necessarily. Um, pardon the pun uh, over the next five years. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's an interesting outcome of the poll. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's also, uh, if you look at, let's say, if it's number of, trans of transactions or uh, total value of, uh, of the investment activity, we've seen the infrastructure funds coming in with a lot of capital. Um, also, as most of the funds that, uh, that have made an investment or uh, are interested in the space uh, sit on multi-billion uh, funds, then... Uh, there's a lot of dry powder uh, in the in the in the financial sector as well. So dry powder being um, uh, capital that uh, that has been raised by uh, fund managers uh, and has not been invested yet. And this is a very uh, steep in, steeply increasing amount over time. We expect that they will be quite active uh, in the space. And um, as of the three, there the, uh, between energy companies, oil and gas maids, and infrastructure funds, that's actually the the least, um, that the lowest percentage. I would be more in favor of the infrastructure funds a little bit more because they have so much capital available and also a need uh, to invest into the space. Yeah, and interesting yeah. that the vehicle manufacturers are only at 11 percent. The perhaps the, the 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 sleeping giants when it comes to EV charging, but of course maybe more focused on developing the the vehicles themselves rather than the charging infrastructure. Yeah, I think what, what is also really interesting is Dominic here is uh, to which extent uh, as the market continue to grow is this uh, ongoing integration with the energy markets. I think we can already see it with, with scale, the increasing presence of storage, even in some cases to vehicle to grid integration. Um, it's a very interesting question to how much the energy companies will be involved in the funding of all these from a pure capital uh, uh, formation standpoint. I think what is certain is that they will be involved in, in terms of operation, in terms of overall integration. Um, however, I think that what is interesting is that no single company can really fund the whole uh, the, the whole market. I think at the end of the day, we are looking at you know so much charging taking place in in, car, in, in homes. Uh, in public places and, ult and ultimately as well we will have as we as we see the, the next phase here the fourth one which is really the the, uh, the scaling and the the emergence of the market consolidation it will be not just a consolidation in terms of the players but even in terms of the use cases we will not only be talking about uh, ev charging for cars which is all, often of our reference point but we will have fleets increasingly uh, buses uh, trucks uh, even other type of vehicles going to uh, from ships to eventually uh, s certain flying things. So I think charging will take a more more complete role, um, and there will be there will be a, a, a significant consolidation around the uh, the players. Uh, and while there will be also this um, increased integration with the energy market, uh, the funding, uh, which is what we are largely focusing on today, um, is likely to to come from a source of funding which is really not limited such by individual companies, which is. Uh, in many ways, these, these infrastructure funds that come, let's not forget, from a lot of different sources with a long-term horizon, whether they are pension funds, insurance companies, and channeled by certain very large infrastructure funds with, which have multi-billion energy funds. Um, and that will, that will uh, in turn, lead to our fifth phase, which, with this kind of emergence of certain leaders at the end, that will be mostly driven by, by cost consideration, by cost and efficiency consideration. I think the, when you look at being able to extract the most out of the energy market in combination with charging and storage, uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, geographical factors that are different, uh, but as a whole scale makes a large difference. I think you will see some leaders being very adept at doing that with the right form of software, um, having a sign uh, raising significant economies of scale on the hardware front. Uh, and this is where we will see ultimately uh, in the next uh, 10 to 12 years, the emergence, not only initially of this market consolidation, but then of the, of the global leaders. Um, and needless to say, if you look at where we are today in this phase four, um, we may look at the market overall of, of charging for, for cars, but for vehicles as, as an area when you have a lot of growth, like plenty of growth still there. But interestingly, uh, the number of players available uh, with, with a strong uh, footprint, with a lot of capabilities, and that has good momentum, uh, is, be, is, is uh, slowing, is becoming smaller and smaller. Looking at the UK now, you have some very dynamic 
reasonably smaller and fast growing company but among the, the large companies i think we we don't really have large independent players anymore with a 25 30 percent plus of the market share uh so that's another phenomenon we see here the the reduction of the name of of the number of available players in this m and activity which is also driving up a competition uh, thank, thanks for that, for that, Dominic. And and just just actually, I'm just looking at some of the questions that have come in. There's one question which is around, you know, it seems that we're just talking about public charging only. What, what about the the home charging? And it's a really pertinent question. Um, and I think we touched upon it a little bit just in the last few minutes. But we're not just talking about public. We're we're talking about all different aspects of EV charging, whether it's home, workplace, destination charging, or what we call kind of transit charging, which is those high power charging hubs. But of course, I mean, I guess the those different types of charging are going to be more or less attractive to different types of investors. So the institutional investors like the pension funds or the infrastructure funds may be more uh, kind of aligned with sort of the public rollout of the infrastructure. Um, of course, we've seen some transactions in the past couple of years around the oil and gas majors, for example, who are acquiring companies who are much more focused on the AC side so um it's kind of the the lower power charging which is more prevalent for for home and workplace for example um so i guess that's sort of uh, related to sort of the, the patchwork of different types of charging and the fact that um in the future there's not going to be one silver bullet which sort of ticks every ev driver's need and so it's going to require lots of investment from different types of players focusing on different parts of the value chain and focusing on different locations yeah, I mean, uh, we we see certainly in that in the in this respect the composition of the market evolving um, uh, uh, as you, as you tend towards a lot more penetration of uh, electric vehicles. Uh, by definition, not everyone uh, will will be able to have a, a driveway or an area where to charge your car at home, um, and therefore you will see on the one hand more hubs, and again the type of investment which is quite suitable for for uh, for infra, infra funds or where you have a, quite a bit of infrastructure or even in a residential sense you will have a lot of multi-dwelling type of charging where you require a bit more of a complex equipment where it is more energy management when you have a high number of charger deployed and again there's already quite a few funds or financial institutions very focused on how they can get into this market and already going into this market which is the the multi-dwelling uh residential market which we will see more and more uh, but indeed that, that that is part of an overall market that include home but a lot of other type of charging as well yeah thanks dominic um conscious of time well, we've got a few other slides to get through and we've got about 10 minutes left of sharing content so um, I think now we wanted to say a few words, Sharif, um, in terms of the different specific uh, asset types. Go over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I think it was a, it was a, the, the question you, that was just raised was spot on. So you definitely see a change or a difference if, in type of investors and type of buyers across the value chain. So if you more like look at the the owner operator of public charge points uh, and then. Um, you see a big influx of capital uh, from infrastructure funds and really the, the regional champions of comp companies that are active in the, the more mature EV uh, markets, such as Norway and the Netherlands uh, is there as well. Um, so growing in contact uh, with Spotcraft uh, as, as, as of their uh, recently their uh, majority shareholder, I think are one of the leading players in, uh, in the Nordics as well. Um, and they are expanding um, throughout Europe with uh, selective uh, acquisitions in Germany. And they recently took over the uh, Vattenfall EV charging network in uh, in the UK as well. So there you see a, a company that has been able to um, uh, to get a good and solid market position with uh, a, a well-utilized network uh, that has access to data or where to, um, to, to build out and deploy a network in order to make it profitable, that is bringing this knowledge and capabilities uh, to other areas uh, in, in Europe as well, where the companies that are active in uh, in that area are not the ones that have the data and the knowledge and the capabilities of uh, rolling out a network, and it's difficult to build up that data. So uh, if you take the UK as an example, you would also have uh, an InstaFault as a um, uh, quite a good example of a company that is uh, rolling out a network in a certain region or a country and building up a position as a king of a country and by that uh, having also uh, leverage over uh, other players uh, as they're one of the first that are executing uh, a land grabbing strategy and uh, building out a large network in, in the UK as well. 
So in the public fast charging network, you see a um, um, different of strategies. Some are having a more pan-European scope uh, and uh, Ionity and Tesla with a, a pan-European scope from the start because their uh, interest was uh, not so much in going into the areas where there's a high EV penetration, but more rolling out infrastructure so they can uh, sell off their cars. As throughout Europe, EV adoption is uh, increasing, you would also see these, uh, these networks becoming more and more profitable and benefit from uh, having uh, executed the land grab uh, strategy first and uh, securing high traffic locations as well. Um, so this is a very dynamic area where um, we definitely going to see a lot more interesting transactions taking place. Um, also see more and more infrastructure funds um, uh, expanding into the uh, EV charging sector. And what I think is an increasing, uh, increasingly um, uh, trend is that we see other types of capital, such as pension funds, who have an even lower uh, return and a longer investment horizon uh, coming into play. And I think that's another trigger for um, uh, attracting more capital into the sector as well. If we go to the next one, um, that's the, the asset light uh, charge point operators. Those are companies that have been <coughs> focusing more on the home and the workplace charging segment, so the standard charging. Uh, companies like EV Box, New Motion, and Potpoint, who uh, we've been working closely with. And there you see more interest from utilities and oil and gas majors that um, made a platform investment in uh, acquiring quite a sizable company and then looking into boltons of uh, new types of technologies or new types of, um, uh, of investments uh, of, of, of technologies such as the um, multi unit dwelling. Uh, charging applications or charging for urban areas where there are quite different dynamics um, than, than typical home charging uh, or off-street home charging or workplace charging. Uh, so we definitely uh, saw in 2018 a, a, a steep increase of, uh, of interest from oil and gas mates and utilities of making these investments. And then going uh, forward, um, we do expect more acquisitions uh, in this area for um, a specific technology or geographical expansion. And there's a big need for scale in this, uh, in this sector because the, the typical um, um, car companies and car leasing companies who are uh, selling off the electric vehicles, they operate European-wide or even globally. And therefore, these more service-oriented companies uh, need to also ensure that they can provide the services on a, a larger geographical scale as well. So, and that will drive a whole range of more acquisitions into the space uh, into other parts of Europe, so the Southern Europe or the Eastern part of Europe, uh, but also on a global scale um, uh, towards Asia and the US. Um, one of the examples here, of course, is uh, the new motion and, uh, and green lots have both been acquired by, by Shell, and we're actually building a whole new uh, ecosystem around power, um, the power value chain with also other investments such as Lime Jump and, uh, and Sonnen. Uh, so that took a quite an interesting uh, strategy, and it will be interesting to see who will be the leading uh, energy company in the space uh, in, in the asset light uh, charge point operations uh, side of the value chain. Uh, I'm going to the back end provide. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Sorry, just just monitoring the uh, the questions again. I just had um, a question about asset light and uh, and what what that means. What what makes them asset light? Do the customers own the AC charge point? Yeah, so the asset light charge point operators they mostly sell, install, and uh, operate uh, operate charge points. And asset heavy uh, players they invest themselves into charge uh, points and then offer it as a service to uh, to either B two B customers or EV drivers. Uh, and the, the different uh, definition is that the asset heavy uh, CPOs would have charge points on their balance sheet actually, and asset lights would sell it off as um, uh, as as a product and as a service to other players as well. Thank you. And we've got two different uh, player types here, Sharif. Um, we we don't have too much in the way of uh, time left, but do you want to say just a quick word in terms of the back-end providers before finishing off with the, the charge point manufacturers? Yeah, so the back-end providers, so you see a number of uh, scalable uh, technology companies offering back-end uh, services uh, white-labeled. 
so that's an interesting uh, sector as well, but we haven't seen that much large M&A in, in, in the sector. Um, so I think there are most strategies that we've seen here is um, investing strategically into uh, innovate, innovative technology. Uh, and when this market hits scale, we do expect other type of uh, buyers or investors coming on board, such as large software companies or even uh, transaction processing companies that recognize this as a whole new market for where a lot of transactions will uh, will happen and take place. On the hardware so, side, Adam, well, I was, I was just um, going to make a point there, Sharif, about the fact that the you know, these backend providers who are it's essentially a software play. Um, they don't have the, the same channels perhaps as the, the CPOs who have got kind of hardware in the ground. So in terms of scalability and moving into new markets, these are players that could be relatively nimble in terms of moving into some of the, the key emerging markets we might see uh, growing in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and then finally, the, the manufacturers. Yeah, so this is a place where we have seen less transactions. Um, number of industrials such as ABB have been uh, quite active, uh, recently invested in FreeWire, which has a, a very interesting battery integrated uh, charging solution. And by that opening up a new market for ABB that they couldn't tap in uh, by themselves. And ABB also being uh, expanding geographically with a recent acquisition, a majority acquisition of Chargebot. Um, so this is a place where technology R&D really makes a difference um, and also um, created uh, some quite some valuable companies such as a Heliox, Tritium, um, that um, yeah, we see leading the pack and also having technology advantage over other players. At the lower end of the spectrum, we would see, let's say, uh, charging charging manufacturers offering AC or standard equipment, also trading at lower valuations than uh, the more innovative companies. And, and we've had a question come in, Sharif, uh, quite a good question about what, what does LTM actually stand for? Uh, what, what's that referring to? Is that an abbreviation which yeah. is included on, on these slides? Yeah, that's a very good question. So in the, in the database that we built, we've analyzed the, the revenues that were uh, available. Um, and LTM means the last 12 month revenues. And that was the, ah, okay. uh, the valuation methodology that was mostly uh, applicable in this sector uh, for a number of reasons that we mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, okay, so last 12 months. Very good. Um, okay, and uh, still very conscious of the time, and we, we need to sort of wrap up so, so that we can spend a few minutes at the end talking about um, going through some of the questions. Um, but I wanted to say a few words in terms of what we think the, the, the future holds. Um, so I invite a few of you to sort of say a few words here. Um, but from my side, you know, there's a question. We've, we've mentioned the auto OEMs. Um, they came out relatively poorly versus some of the, the other types of players, I guess, in our poll, only 11% uh, of people thinking that the car OEMs are going to be really leading the, the M&A transactions um, going forward. Of course, we've seen some examples, Tesla, probably the most obvious example of a company that is developing really a vertically integrated solution, developing the, the, the cars, clearly, the, the chargers, the, the networks of chargers, but also things like their energy storage and, and solar as well, and providing these solutions to, to customers as a one-stop shop. Um, Volkswagen, perhaps, with their Ellie brand, who have great ambitions um, to, to provide energy services to their customers beyond the vehicle. And what we've been looking at, um, especially when it comes to home charging, is uh, within Delta EE, is sort of who will have that customer relationship. Will it be the, the energy companies who will continue to provide energy tariffs, so EV tariffs, together with uh, access to public charging, perhaps with you know, bundling in a, a vehicle, um, either an outright sale or, or maybe uh, a, a leased vehicle. But I think there's, there's still an untapped opportunity there for you know, a, a, an open question about who is going to be best placed to have that customer relationship um, in the future. Um, energy companies, I think, have that relationship today. Um, but will the OEMs um, pull their socks up in the next uh, years and actually want to try and uh, have that customer relationship to provide energy services beyond the car? I think a lot, of, you know, and I think we'll see some companies, some car OEMs starting to do that, um, but still a lot will need to happen, I think, and maybe led by some M&A transactions to enable those car manufacturers to, to have that uh, ability to provide those energy services to customers um, over the next five years. 
Yeah, and, and maybe one one aspect which is relevant here is that I think in, 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 in parallel to this evolution you just mentioned is that and I think for, for everyone listening, that's one of the messages we have, whether you, you own a company, you're an entrepreneur, you're an investor looking to invest into the market, is that the, the financial evolution will not stop here. You have really uh, a lot of what will come along with the technology in the sector. There will be the commercial and financial innovation that will going forward match the risk profile and the customer preferences. Uh, one example of that, for instance, is this charging as a service that you see where instead of selling the capex directly to B2B customers or fleet, what you see in this very emerging trend uh, is instead uh, selling for fixed price per, per month, for instance, or, or, or per kilowatt hour or a combination of both uh, the services instead of selling the, the entire thing. Um, so I think those type of solutions will continue uh, to, to come in and to innovate and to show some innovation on the financial side as the market keep, will keep evolving. And of course, one of the things that we look at very closely within Delta EE is the, the wider uh, electricity system market and how this massive uptake of EVs is going to impact the electricity grid um, in terms of huge demand coming on in the evening when people come home to plug in their vehicles, for example. Um, and I think most people on the line will be familiar with the terms smart charging and, and V2G. Um, smart charging already delivering some of the benefits of flexible EV charging to try and you know, fluctuate when and and how we charge the vehicles, vehicle to grid, that bi-directional way of charging vehicles and also discharging to provide energy back to the grid at times of high demand, a technology with a lot of an innovative projects happening at the moment, the commercials not necessarily stacking up today in terms of uh, the capex and opex, um, but with this huge cost reduction curve potential um, and I think a technology which has a big role to play in the future, especially when it comes to uh, workplace fleets. Is that an intake of breath, Alex? Did you want to uh, add another point? Yeah. Or? Yeah. No, I think I think you summed that up nicely. Um, I'm just just conscious of, uh, of of time here and I thought I'd just take the opportunity to bring in a couple of questions that we've seen coming through and um, I think this is actually quite a nice um, nice summary question here that we've we've just received um, which I'd be glad to hear um, a couple of viewpoints on um, which part of the value chain supply deploy operation and energy services do you see as being the most valuable so any takers on that one? It's a, um, it's a it, I think if you, if you look at, let's say the long-term value uh, that, that, that comes from, um, uh, from EV charging, uh, the operations part is, is the most valuable. And also look, if you look at where most transactions have taken place, uh, that is the space. And um, the energy service is also an interesting, uh, interesting uh, part of the value chain, but that's still quite small, and also the volumes are not there yet to uh, really make it work. And also that has led to not that many uh, transactions in that space, but the transactions that have, that have taken uh, place in that space were at, um, skyrocketed uh, valuations uh, that were not comparable to any part of the value chain as well. So um, if you look, let's say, where most uh, consolidation has taken place now, it's definitely with the asset light and the asset heavy CPOs. Um, and then the backend providers are, operate a very scalable model, um, but we still need to see who the winners are going to be in that uh, in that domain. Um, so that's broadly speaking, it's difficult to say which part is the most valuable. Uh, but if you look at the transactions, it would be definitely the, the operations at this stage. Great, thank you. Yeah. And uh, uh, oh, sorry, Dominic, did you want to add to that? No, just to reinforce what Sharif mentioned, indeed, the, also the operations also lead the door to the energy management because it is indeed part of the, the operation. So that's an, an, an additional, I would say, vector of value that you see that is also part of what, what the, uh, the overall financial equations and, and that's linked closely to the operations. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple of questions on the other types of player in this space. Um, uh, John, you've just mentioned uh, your thoughts on, on automotives, um, but we've had questions about what the future of the petrol station is, uh, for example, and also a question on kind of big tech players. You know, how, what, what about Microsoft and Google? Um, so a couple of thoughts from my side there. Um, first of all, with uh, petrol stations, you know, the, 
we're seeing huge growth with 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 EVs, but it, it is going to be a, a multi-decade transition. So there's still a, a business model um, that will last across many markets for for quite some time. Uh, the duration of that will um, will be will differ from from country to country. And we are starting to see new charging hub models replacing that that petrol station uh, forecourt approach. On the um, and tech giants, I think there's an interesting role here again for that customer relationship play. Um, maybe it's the automotives um, who who have that. They have the brand, so maybe you'll be um, doing your charging services through them. But if you think about public charging and you think about how you navigate um, the world today, most people use Google Maps. There are many more customers of Google Maps than there are customers of um, most brands of electric vehicle. So if all charging went via Google Maps, all of a sudden Google could completely own that public charging EV customer relationship. The opportunity is there if they see that there is a, um, a valuable business model for it. And as a result, we do see lots of software companies, lots of startups looking to uh, get investment or perhaps uh, exits through either automotives, oil majors, or indeed um, tech giants. And, and Google are already in North America um, offering uh, when people do their route planning on Google Maps from A to B um, with their EV offering sort of charging solutions on route as well. I think the, the first step on you know, providing those charging services to, to customers. I think we'll see Google and those other tech giants increasingly taking, uh, taking some concrete steps on, on that journey. We've got a couple more minutes. There, there was a question that came in okay. around uh, is the potential integration of microgrids with EV charging. Um, so yeah, I think the short answer is absolutely. I mean, local energy communities um, is something that we've looked at quite a lot within Delft EE, and the ability to uh, co-locate both the EV charging infrastructure that's going to be required at a street level, for example, together with the, the solar that's on people's roofs, potentially also with uh, stationary batteries uh, or batteries indeed within the vehicles themselves. And seeing the, the emergence of business models which allow the innovative use of combining those assets to provide not just services to the grid to minimize you know, the, 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 the drawdown from the grid at peak times, for example, but also sharing energy back to the grid, but also doing that in such a way that that provides uh, value to to customers, both in terms of uh, reductions in in their energy tariffs, but also in terms of other values in terms of um, you know providing uh, you know, value back to the, back to the system, uh, and, and benefiting from the use of renewable electricity um, rather than you know drawing down electricity from the grid. So I think absolutely big opportunities for for a combination of microgrids and together with charging. Okay, um, and just bundling together a few few questions at the end here. Um, there's been a few questions around um, the cost of EVs. They're very expensive. Uh, what, what's happening to to bring down those costs today and support people who can't afford uh, a brand new Polestar or uh, or Tesla? Um, and what the future is of uh, charging. Um, you know, the, the, the cost of public charging, particularly for that high powered charging, which is very expensive kit. And if the, if you're saying, um, you know, Sharif, you mentioned around the uh, the value being in the operations side, you know, are we going to see free charging or is it going to be really expensive charging? And any any views on 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 the costs um, from the panel would be interesting. And um, from my side, just on in terms of how we're making EVs um, more affordable, well. We're, we're just growing the market. Um, we'll reach economies of scale that allow for the cost um, of an EV to become comparable with uh, an ICE in different markets for different segments at some point over the next few years. A major player there is the public sector and we're seeing lots of governments building green bounce back economic stimulus packages that are increasing the uh, incentive for, for the um, uh, consumers to be able to purchase an EV. 
at the same side, we're, we're seeing novel ways for to enable people to get into new vehicles that they might not um, have done before. So there are some uh, state-sponsored uh, car club schemes happening to help people who are um, less wealthy enable them to be uh, mobile, enable them to have clean uh, cars in their area at a lower uh, cost. Um, but um, yeah, guys from Drake Star or, or John, if you have any views on the future of, of costs for for public charging, are we, any um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so you see development uh, in the space. So, for instance, uh, Ionity has increased their their prices for their uh, public charging infrastructure, um, and we would definitely expect that uh, the pricing on public charging infrastructure will become more transparent um, and. Even with a increased pricing, I think uh, on a total level uh, with uh, people charging uh, at home, at work, where uh, electricity prices are, are much lower, uh, and in some cases uh, in public uh, on public locations where they uh, where there's a higher uh, price uh, per kilowatt hour, um, even on a total basis, it's much much lower, and um, I think that's a trend that we will continue to see across the board. Thanks for that, Sharif. Now we'll, we'll we'll need to wrap up because we're we're out of time. One thing we've not really mentioned yet, and actually this is the reason for the webinar, is this report that we have co-authored. So Drake Star and Delta EE together, the report EV charging at the crossroads, the path, the curious, and the race for scale uh, was published yesterday, and it's available to download now for free. Um, the links are there uh, on the page there, so please do feel free to go to Drake Star's website or Delta's website to download the report. Um, so we'd be really pleased for you to, to do that. Um, and so just some final some final wrap up comments. Um, so Delta EE, we are uh, we're, we're a research consulting company. We, we've put together lots of insights and data on how we see the European EV charging market, and we'd be very happy to continue the conversation. So do please feel free to to get in touch. Um, and Frank, do you want to say a final closing statement from your side as well? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, uh, John, Alex, uh, Sharif, and Dominique. Um, indeed, uh, for us also, uh, the webinar, the report, the slides, uh, it's not just an hour well spent on a rainy afternoon in Amsterdam, um, but it's an invitation, uh, an invitation to continue uh, to share insights, to uh, develop intelligence together, uh, to ensure optimum efficiency, to guarantee the best possible return on capital invested, uh, to build the ideal customer journey to serve all stakeholders, uh, including, by the way, our planet. So, um, indeed, do reach out. Don't hesitate. Uh, contact us. Contact uh, Delta EE. Uh, send us an email. Share your views, uh, ambitions, needs, and requirements. Uh, we will definitely follow up. Um, I think the team uh, Delta EE and uh, Drake Star Amsterdam uh, is uh, is eager to, uh, of course, make sure that uh, the time spent not only today, but uh, especially on the insights uh, behind this um, will be there and remain uh, be there to, uh, to be shared. Um, we believe in innovation. Uh, we also believe in the new mobility. We are sure that uh, this is going to be a space with only a few winners. Uh, so we're absolutely looking forward to, to our next contact. And uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you, Frank, and thank you to everyone for listening. Yeah, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.